welcome to A for No, B for Yes. Welcome to A for No, B for Yes, where we link together the story of the Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. Today we have a real blister of an episode for you today as we venture back to Death Mountain after the seven year time skip and the forest temple. Make it stop. My name is Anthony and with me are my other co-hosts. I'm Ryan Fonzie. And I'm Cameron Hagee. All right, so last episode we left off at the forest temple where we had an outing with Phantom Ganon and beat him up and came across the first sage, Saria. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's really much more to share than what we went through last time. I mean, it's kind of cool. I mean, we got the medallion. Uh, power of friendship is uh, is in our hands, right? So we got out. We talked to the Deku Sprout. I think one thing that was kind of cool that we covered was that the temp- the forest temple was like a session about like fear and doubt and how Link was trying to overcome those feelings, right? Um, and then right at the end, you get a Deku sprout, who's kind of like the reincarnation of the great Deku tree, basically coming back just to reaffirm, hey, yeah, you are the child of destiny, and this is what you're supposed to do, and you are definitely fit for it, so go do the thing. Yeah. Um, so, And I believe this episode, we have another touch on the original route that we were going with the Dodongo's Cavern being power, I think we're definitely going to be able to also touch on power this episode as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we definitely go through the same pattern. It's kind of cool because you, as you go, you kind of see how Link um, has, like, planted these seeds of relationships and, like, kind of started off all of these things. And um, how they pick up seven years later after kind of just, you know, Link having – uh, effectively disappeared for that entire time um, is different in each place. Um, and this last one, um, I mean, you, you don't actually see Saria until you're in the uh, Temple of Sages, like the Temple of Light, you know, um, the Chamber of Sages, sorry, not the Temple of Sages. Um, and this next one, we actually get to see our old friend before we actually get to that. Um, but we'll get more into that uh as we come up to it in the story. I think after this, um, I mean, if you remember, Sheik kind of mentioned a forest, and the next thing she mentioned was a mountain, that there would be a temple inside the mountain. Um, but if you don't remember, Navi will certainly interrupt you at some point in the next... As Navi always does. You know, session of gameplay, and, and will basically say, hey, did you see that giant ring above Death Mountain? <laughs> Yeah, pretty quickly. I think something's going on. So the game definitely tries to direct you to, to the Fire Temple next. Um, and to do that, I mean, there's a couple ways you can go. Um, I always usually end up finding myself back in Goron City. Yeah, I definitely revisited Goron City as well. I made my way up the mountain. and Well, when you get into Goron City, it comes as a surprise maybe to everyone that... There are no longer Gorons present in the city at all. Ghost city. <laughs> Ghost Ron city. <laughs> Ghost Ron city. <laughs> yeah, so there's no Gorons here, but once you check it out a little bit, you see that there is one, and he's going around in the same like circular pattern, the same circular area that the previous Goron that gave you the big bomb bag when you blasted him near the certain spot was. Except this one moves a lot faster and is on the smaller side, so it's a lot harder to actually hit him. I managed to do it on my first bomb somehow. I don't know about you guys. Okay. MLG! Hashtag MLG. Bragging Note. <laughs> no, not at all. Did not hit him on the first time somehow. Um, For me, it was two. But yeah, it, it is funny. It's like there's a new, there's a new, what, what did he call himself? The hot rodder Goron before. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now there's like a little one that's actually faster and kind of better at avoiding. Um, I think the, the trick to this is to try to manipulate the time that it takes him to turn around because he also avoids you. Um, which I don't think the big one did. No, it did not. <laughs> um, this little one, if you run towards it, it will actually stop before it hits you and turn and go the other way. Um, and that gives you a little extra time if you have the bomb placed right to kind of like have him float around it for a second. Yeah. Um, it just gives you a better window 
if you uh, if you manage to play it right. Mm-hmm. And once you successfully bomb him, he lets you know that everybody went to the fire temple to try to stop the evil dragon that has been resurrected by Ganondorf, including Darunia himself. So yeah, we, we blow him up, and the first thing he thinks is that you must be one of Ganondorf's men, right? Like, he's like, why would you do that to me? You must be one of Ganondorf's men. Um, and then he says, hear my name and tremble. <laughs> I am Link, hero of the Gorons. And I mean... Clearly inspired by Link. Which is kind of funny be- because, like, yeah, obviously, like, he's not Link, hero of the Gorons, because that's y- that's you. <laughs> so so you walk over and you talk to him. And the first thing he, he, he said, like, when he finally sees you, he's like, oh, wait a minute, your name's Link? Oh, that must mean you're the hero of the core. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh man, can I can I, can I have your autograph? And he's and then he like immediately corrects himself. And he's like, oh wait, it's probably not a good time for that. Uh, can you help everybody? <laughs> um, so then he tells you about how um, Ganondorf, uh, all of his followers came and basically took all of the Gorons into uh, Death Mountain um, to be eaten by this ancient evil dragon that Ganondorf actually revived, um, which kind of plays back into that whole, is Ganondorf a necromancer? Um, Definitely. You know, when he gets around volcanoes, he definitely is. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what it is about him reviving ancient creatures in this area, but I guess it's just the the easiest tool that he has at hand. But um, basically says all the the Gorons were captured and taken away while Darunia was out. Um, Doesn't say what Darunia was doing out, but he was out. (laughs) <laughs> and they all got c- captured, basically. Um, and then when Darunia came back, he uh, he headed towards the Fire Temple to try to rescue everybody. So this is uh, – Darunia is on a solo mission, and um, he's going to do this thing. And he said the, the one thing that's kind of concerning, though, is that um, in order to defeat Vol- – because the, the Gorons, this isn't their first run-in with Volvagia, right, this dragon. Um, they actually had to fight him before. Um, and there was a uh, quote unquote like legendary Goron hero who used the legendary hammer mm-hmm. um, to to defeat Volvagia with like a single hit, it sounds like. Because he just says he used the hammer and boom, defeated him just like that. Bam. And so, like, that's like the legend of Volvagia. Um, it's kind of cool because, like, this is like the first time we see like a, an, I guess the Goron oral history, right? Like they're kind of given their own background, like the story of the Gorons before Link. Um, and what's what's also kind of great about that is that Link is now part of that same oral history. Like he's he's like in the next breath, and he's like, oh, and then there was this other giant Dodongo, and the Dodongo Buster Link <laughs> came and he was the hero of the Goron, the Buster. You know? He's his own hero in his own right to the Gorons. Yeah, so much that Darunia named his own son after mm. Link. Um, cause he does tell you that as well, that this is like, that Darunia is his father. Um, which, you know, is like, it's pretty big honor. Can we say Goron's age fast? Because it's only only seven years. We don't know exactly when Darunia had Link, but <laughs> he is a tot, not, he's like a child at this point. So I want to say the age pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. He's very mature and polite for his age. Right. Being like what, right? Seven at the most. Yeah, like seven. Like did like did he have a kid on the way when Link maybe went to like go through time? Yeah. Like at the thing is like they're okay. Just just as a point, I, they don't ever like call this out in the game, but there aren't any female Gorons. No. Like I don't know if they wrote wrote them in later. Like I, I haven't really thoroughly checked Breath of the Wild to see if there's one or not. No, there's not. But f- most of the games, there are no female Gorons. Like they shed a rock or something, and it becomes a new baby Goron. So yeah, so they're not they're not like the Darunia didn't have a wife who was pregnant with with Link. Like that wasn't a thing. Like we don't know how Link came to be, but <laughs> at most he's seven years old at this point. Um, yeah. For all for all we know, like. Yeah, that could have that could have been some like budding process or something. Like nobody knows. <laughs> I also want to detail on when you were mentioning Volvagia and Ganondorf reincarnating him, and with uh, Dodongo actually as well. We know that when he revived Dodongo, he did it sort of to keep the Gorons away from his matters because he knew that they were a very powerful race and most likely. I mean, with his magic, maybe he could have taken out the Gorons. But again, we see here, even if he does think he's 
the big bad Ganondorf. He still doesn't want to get his hands dirty in battle. And so I feel like he is still terrified of the Goron power. <clears throat> so what he does, you know, obviously he rev uh, revives Volvagia to eat the Gorons, basically sending a message to anyone who would try and oppose him, like, hey, I play dirty, you're not going to beat me. Yeah, and it's kind of a... It's a very similar theme. Yeah, and, it, and there's a cool distinction there where, like, you know, before he was using um, the food source as, like, leverage to get the Sacred Stone in order to get the Triforce. Um, <laughs> now that he has... Now they are the food. Yeah, now that he has the Triforce of Power, um, he's he's literally using the Gorons to try to to, to send, like, a warning to the other races. Um, like, I think the, uh, like, I think Link and, and when we run into Darunia, they both kind of say something like that, where he's, he's trying to feed the Gorons to Vavagia so that any other race that wants to defy him, like, will have this example set. Um, so he's definitely like, now he's like, he knows that he's more powerful. Um, one of the, you know, like, and, and he's, he's just trying to you know, make an example of this powerful race. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if he takes out the, the biggest, baddest one, like who else is going to stand up? You know, like it's, it's a yeah intimidation tactics pretty. Yeah, exactly. Um, one question that I had about this is who are Ganondorf's followers? Like the ones who came into the Goron city and captured all the Gorons, like, were they the Gerudo? Like, were they other, like, did the, all of the Gerudo fortress group like come and, What's, and, like, carry out this mission, do you think? Or, like, do you think it was just, like, creature minions? It's funny you mention that because this game never really showed Ganondorf with any men. I mean, you know, you have, like, Link to the Past. You have Twilight Princess. You have Wind Waker. All these games show Ganondorf has faithful minions. And this game really didn't, aside from maybe the Moblins could be his uh followers and anything he revived so i've always wondered that like what are his minions you know <laughs> he doesn't really have on screen any minions unless it's just the monsters in the dungeon i mean you know i assume it would be a mix of some sort of summoned thing that you don't see in the game and the gerudo and maybe even the things from a temple later on that's connected to ganon's area the desert mm. or ganondorf's area Maybe, yeah. I mean, I know that. I know that the Gerudo, like some of them, do still like they revere Ganondorf and uh, all that. Like we haven't gotten that far in the game yet, but like I know that they are still followers of Ganondorf. Like he's still their king. Um, not that he's there. Like he's at his own castle outside the desert. So I don't know how he carries out that that whole position. But I mean, he still holds it. I know that. Yeah. So we get done talking to Link. And um, as long as you talk to him about everything, because he's he's he kind of throws a tantrum, and you kind of have to talk to him to calm him down. He'll uh he'll gift you the Goron tunic, um, which is a Kokorish tunic, <laughs> yeah, um, of course, uh, made by the Gorons to be heat resistant. Very true. Um, it's it's just funny that like nobody else in in Hyrule wears like the Hylians don't really wear tunics all that often. I think there's maybe. A couple characters you might be able to argue are wearing a tunic, but but not really. It's more just a long shirt. <laughs> you could argue that like maybe Link had it because his dad made it for Link in hopes he would return. I mean, it's stretching it very far, but like Darunia made it. I mean, I think that okay, that tunic was definitely for sale in the shop when you were a kid, though. So, but nobody wanted it. True, true, true. I mean, maybe that one specifically was made for you. Um, that could be a thing, but but why do, why does the shop stock them though? That's what I want to know. I have not a clue. So anyway, he he gives you this tunic, and then he basically like he, I don't know if he unlocks like how how that works. He he gives you the tunic, and then he's like basically says you can get there through. Um, I think he says you can get through there through Darunia's chamber. I don't know if you actually if he actually does tell you that, but that does open up after you get done talking to him. Yeah, the statue. Um, the king, the king's chamber opens up, and the shop opens up, which is kind of funny because the shop owner is still there. <laughs> um, I think, I think, got to run a shop, man. There are two giant Gorons that uh, like weren't taken, and I think that's just for obvious reasons. Like they, they couldn't really move away from their position. Also, they're huge. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, we we haven't talked to them yet about them yet, and I don't think that we need to this episode either. Not yet. <laughs> um, they're really a side quest at this point, and one of them's not even like a real side quest. It's like a a troll move that the game plays. Um, but yeah, so so you can make your way out, put on that that red tunic that you just got, and make your way out into the crater. Um, and what you'll find is like a broken bridge. Um, which luckily we have a hook shot that'll get us across. Um, and once we do, we run into Sheik. You see her again. Um, this is the second or third. Is, I think it's the third appearance of Sheik if you count the Temple of Time. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Yes, it is. Um, and I guess I, I can just read the line because um, they don't even really say hello. They just go straight into this poem-esque speech. Um, and it's it's all about friendship. And I, I actually have it here. I'll just I'll just read it. Um, yeah, friendship. They say, it is something that grows over time, a true friendship, a feeling in the heart that becomes even stronger over time. The passion of friendship will soon blossom into a righteous power, and through it, you will know which way to go. This song is dedicated to the power of the heart. Listen to the bolero of fire. Or, I guess, bolero of fire, I think is how you're supposed to pronounce that. Bolero, yeah. Um, the real word has, like, an accent over the E. Um just from like googling it Mm -hmm. um and the game did does not (laughs) but yeah so so yeah if we're trying to take these as hint i mean the last one you know was was about like um you know it was like memories of your childhood and the the uh, passage of time always being cruel and there was like all these like kind of details about about coming of age and this one is a is about friendship like specifically just about friendship instead um and it talks about how it grows over time. Like, like, so in, in one sense, like the passage of time is like, okay, you're aging. Like there's these like rough things happening. You're becoming this, like you're engaging in, in new areas of life that you haven't before. And it can be confusing and hard. And also like, you know, aging tends to come like after you've done growing tends to come with, you know, some consequence <laughs> um, in a sense, but um, so like there's that aspect of it, but then this one is kind of a more positive spin of like, um, real friendships take time to make, like you don't start out with, with deep friendships, like you have to build them as you go. Right. Um, and so like this one talks about, um, the passion of friendship will blossom into a righteous power. And I think that has to do with like friends helping each other grow as people. Um, then, you know, that's kind of like a little bit of what we get into here. Um, and I mean, it's a righteous power, so it's not like necessarily like character development as much as it is like maybe disciplinary, like, like getting better at like managing your life, I guess. I don't know. Like there's some, there's some cool parts in this that, um, that I think like they do highlight, although very briefly, um, I'm not going to lie. I spent some time trying to find things to really talk about <laughs> for this episode. <laughs> and um, kind of like our original Dodongo episode, like like power is, is always presented kind of simple in this game. And I think that they do that to distinguish it from courage and wisdom. Um, As, yeah. Because power shouldn't be complicated, but that doesn't mean that it's easy either. Um, so, yeah, like I think this is going to, this is obviously like this is going to be our second entry into power and this time we're talking about power in the context of friendship like what kind of power does a friendship bring to your life but i also think that i might be getting a little head here but i also think that um even though this is the power section of the game they still do a great job at blending i want to say wisdom and courage still into the trope because if you know this temple has a lot of puzzles as opposed to the last temples we've been to. And it still takes that, like, I feel like it, everything that Link's been on, it's just building. Like, so even though this is the power dungeon, the power temple, we still see reoccurring themes of wisdom that need to, uh, that come back, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that there's a... Yeah, it's, it's definitely not straightforward. There's a lot in this game, and they, we haven't gotten to this yet either, but there's um, a lot in this game that, that kind of revolves around the balance of these qualities, um, not just like the increase of them, but like having a balanced and stable mindset when it comes to them. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's another like really strong message that the game tries to, I guess, tries to teach or send, um, like, I I think that it's a better discussion for, for the episode kind of where that is mentioned. (laughs) Um, but yeah, like you'll definitely see facets of all three just about everywhere. Um, even when the temple is all themed around one. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, so we, we head inside. Um, I think we've already talked about fire keys, so that's not really an issue, but that's pretty much the first enemy we see. Yeah. Everyone's favorite bird. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the, the only way we can really go is up and to the left. And when we do that, we immediately are faced with our old friend and sworn brother, Darunia. Darunia. Cutscene. Yeah. Cutscene, right? Uh, it's like the whole discussion. He sees you from across the room. Lock eyes from across the room. <laughs> and he's all, he's so happy. He's like, Link, my brother. <laughs> I don't know why I gave him a British accent, but. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be the farthest thing from that. Oh my goodness. Um, Swing your swords while the rhythm booms. Okay. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just not. <laughs> It can't be a thing. <laughs> God. Oh, gosh. So he's like, who's there, right? Like, is that you, Link? Like, he just notices you and, like, kind of makes out who you are from across this, like, heat wave riddled room, right? Oh, it really is, Link. You've grown so big since I last saw you, right? Okay. He says he wants to have a man-to-man talk with you, um, but now it's not a good time for that. He goes through the whole kind of story of Ganondorf um, reviving the dragon um, and he's going to feed the Gorons to it. Like he goes through ba- basically everything. If you, if you talk to Link of the Gorons, um, he, he kind of does a recap. If you didn't talk to Link of the Gorons, this would all be new information. Um, also you wouldn't have a tunic, so you'd probably be pretty frustrated at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd imagine so. Yeah. Cause like the shop doesn't open either unless you talk to him. So I don't there's even just think a lot of, uh, uh blocks. I don't know if you. Darunia's chambers don't even open. Yeah, I think you can get here without talking to it, but yeah. Because I think you can go through the top of the mountain, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, but anyway, he um, he basically says, like, um, you know, he's going to have him eat all the Gorons as a warning um, to the other races. And he says, if that fire breathing dragon escapes from the mountain, all of Hyrule will become a burning wasteland. So basically, this dragon will just wipe out Hyrule if it gets out. Um, he says he's going to go ahead and try to seal the dragon, but he's concerned because he doesn't have the legendary hammer. Um, but he's kind of got to do what he's got to do at this point. So then he go- turns to you and he asks you um, for a favor as a sworn brother. He um, he says, like, hey, like, can you rescue my people? They're they're locked up all throughout the temple in the other direction from where you came. Um, he's like, basically, like, uh, you know. He, he's counting on you and he runs away. Like he basically goes through the door with the big boss key lock on it, <laughs> but he does it off screen. You just kind of hear the chains unravel and come back. Um, so I don't know if this temple had two boss keys or yeah. Darunia is just like video game, just logic. like beast and just like ripped through the chains to get in. <laughs> like who knows? I don't need these doors. He, he duplicated it. Right. But he goes through it and then the lock immediately comes back. Like He goes through it off screen. Like you don't see how he does it. But yeah, then you hear like the lock reassemble somehow. You're like, oh, okay. Right. Um, so now you're on a mission to, I guess, save the Gorons, uh, uh, possibly find a hammer, and then help Darunia seal the dragon. Oh, we find in a hammer. And so this is the Fire Temple. <laughs> um, and I don't know how much there is new about this. But I mean, there's, I think there's two new enemies. Anthony, do you have any... Uh, Insight. There's actually quite a few more new enemies than you would think. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I have the list here. Um, probably one of the first new enemies, aside from everyone's favorite bird, that we run into. Actually, we run into two new enemies in the same room. The flying tiles. Uh, I think you rescue two Gorons at this point. And you get to a room with flying tiles. They look a little out of place on the floor. And as you walk in, you're kind of like, hmm, this looks like a trap. And of course, you get close to them, they fly up with some voodoo magic and come straight at Link. The best yeah. way to deal with them is your shield. I forgot you about those guys. Them. Yeah, they're quite annoying. And I'm, I'm pretty sure 
This is the only temple that they're in as well. And they're only in one spot, right? Yeah. So along in the same room. Mm, I think there's two rooms with them. Oh, okay. There probably is. In the first room, though. Yeah, one's a, one's a Skaltula room, so you don't actually have to go into it. I think the other one oh, also okay, has a Skaltula, you. but you do have to oh. go through it or something like that. So I'm not going to lie, I didn't do weird. any of the Skaltula rooms. So. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. Um, so this next thing in the room, you probably get in the room, and it's probably the first thing you saw. It's disgusting. It looks like moldy spam. It is called a like-like. I don't know why it's called a like-like. I really don't. It. I guess it really like-likes your shield and really like-likes your tunic because if you let it eat you, it will steal your shield and tunic, and if you don't kill them in time, you will lose said shield and tunic as it will digest them. So avoid it at all costs. Uh, the boomerang works really well with this thing. Or not, I'm sorry, not the boomerang, the hook shot. And mm. just beat away at it after that. Just just destroy it. You can use arrows, like, yeah. whatever you need. I um, Whatever you need to do. I quit hook shot, shotting that. Like, I tried the hook shot once to see if it would stun it. And it does, but then it also brings Link to them. Like, there are some enemies that you can hook shot to and actually travel to them doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the like like is one and I'm always trying to keep my distance from these guys so I I, I stopped <laughs> doing that after I tested it I was you were like, like nope, nah not doing that not, no. not playing just, with not playing with fire yeah I just pull out the bow I'm like nah I'm not getting anywhere near that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've always slashed him down it did steal my shield but I killed it pretty quick after and got oh, it back nice, nice. yeah cause it, it yeah. likes your sword but it doesn't like 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 your sword so yeah. I won't steal that. You can <laughs> so, always still fight it. Yeah. Just the tunic and the, the shield, though. Just the tunic and yeah, the shield. Yeah, it's very specific with what it likes. I'm pretty sure that's why about- the tunic and shield are, like, available in shops near you. Because otherwise, you know. Like, <laughs> I, I imagine some. Near some you. Right. Like, because if you get eaten by one of these and you lose your stuff and then you die, it's lost for good. You can't go back and kill the same like like and get it back then. Yo. Um. So you really want to make sure you don't get into a fight when you're almost about to die with one of these things, because if you do get caught, um, it can't be an issue. For sure, for sure. All right, let's see. The next enemy we have on the list is... Fire Slug? (laughs) Yes, the Torch Slug is what it's called. Cam Cam was really excited about the Torch Slug. (laughs) Apparently you like uh, Mag Cargo in disguise. Yeah, it's like the precursor to Mag Cargo. It's how they got Mag Cargo, apparently. Slugma. Yeah, Slugma. Um, it's just a it's just a slug that's on fire. Honestly, that's the best description of it. Yes. Deku nuts, I think, work best. It's like a blah blah lava. It's a lava blah. Yeah, lava blah. I think Deku nuts work best until you get the Megaton Hammer, and once you get the Secret of the Gorons. You can just bash its face in. It'll flip upside down and squirm and cry. And then you can just kill it. <laughs> really sad, but... I've always just slashed it three times with my sword. Oh, you don't even you don't even bother? It's like, ah, okay, this thing. Rah, rah, rah. Just yeah, like the it. first slash puts out the fire, and then two more after that, and it's down. It just runs away. Yeah, they're not, they're not a difficult enemy once you decide to fight them. Like... When they see you, if you haven't done anything to them yet, they they act real bold and they'll like jump at you and stuff. But once you hit them once, they try to run away until their fire comes back. Um, so they're punks. I mean, they've all talk. Yeah, no bark. Blonde bang punk kids. <laughs> Those dang my cargo <laughs> pugs. This volcano's got punk for babies. <laughs> <laughs> These punk enemies in this punk fire temple. Um. Next, we have another thing that's on fire, and that is the red bubble. So previously in the forest temple, we fought the blue bubble and the green bubble. Now is the red bubble, or as I want to say to you guys, it's a red skull that's on fire because apparently Nintendo doesn't know how to name things. (laughs) Come on, man. It's just a bubble. And again... And it jumps out of the lava. Yeah, they jump out of the lava... They they do all sorts of crazy things. Yeah, they're um, they're they look more intimidating than they actually are. Like they, because they usually come out and they like they'll surprise you, but they have really bad aim. They almost never actually hit you. <laughs> they really do. Um, 
so yeah, they're like one of those enemies that's like, I don't know if they're just trying to like scare you into like running the wrong way and falling off of stuff or what. Um, but every time they they put one of these guys in a map, um, they almost like they just, you know, either jump over Link or jump to the side of Link or whatever. Like you can just run forward and usually you don't have to worry about them. They're just like a shot. They're just like a jump scare. Yeah, pretty much. And but they will they will bounce on solid surfaces that you walk on a few times until they get back into the lava. And yeah, the, the shield pretty much takes care of them because they'll just lose their flame. So they're not really a menace to Link at, by any means at all. What could be a menace to Link is the next enemy, which is a door mimic. And <laughs> when you actually free one of the Gorons, I don't know which Goron it is. I don't really remember. But one of the Gorons will tell you that there are fake doors. Fake Real doors fake everywhere. Doors. Get your yeah, fake Volvagia doors. Yeah, is a big advocate of fake doors. It's yeah, great. he had them installed when he got revived, and he's like, why don't we have any fake doors, guys? <laughs> <laughs> so this Goron tells you that you could just blow them up with the special crop, and you'll notice yeah. it's their fake door because they'll be sticking out, and you, when you attack them, they make a different noise. I never attack them. I don't know what noise they make, but it's yeah, pretty now, clearly easy to see. Now that you mention that the Gorons give you that tip to use the special crop, um, I we probably should mention that this whole while we're fighting all these enemies, like through this dungeon, there are Gorons that have been trapped, just like Darunia described. Um, they're all in cages, usually that get opened by a switch, like on the ground. Um, it's like one of, the, them, like one of the regular bu- button switches. Um, they all start out with the same dialogue, and then they all give you a random tip. Um, a lot of them recommend using the Goron special crop for things that sometimes are not what you want to use the special crop for. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. Like, there's one that they talk about, like, a dancing enemy, which we'll get to. Um, and oh, yeah. no, you, don't don't, you, you would not want to use the crop for that. But the Gorons are like, maybe you Mm-mm. should use the special crop. And it's like, no. You guys are just addicted to this crop. <laughs> Listen, they're just... They're just starting a That's marketing they campaign know, man. with the sp- special crop. <laughs> yeah. What else could you possibly have? You have the special yeah, crop. The special crop. I mean, it's the only tool in the in the toolbox, man. Come on. Yeah. Use your power. What do you, what do you mean you're not going to use it? Um. But yeah, I think one one thing I wanted to mention about these guys, aside from you know their their repetitive um kind of thank you statement that they give you, um, is that they're all locked up with small keys. Like, I don't think there's a single one that's not locked up with a small key. Maybe the one that's, I think there might be one that's locked up with the boss key. There's one locked up with the big key. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But think about how messed up that is to be like locked up in a cell. And the only thing that's like not you in the cell is a box with a key in it to a door that you can't reach. It's like, like, that's like psychological warfare like just being like hey you're imprisoned you're all locked up here's a key figure out what it's to oh wait (laughs) that's you can't because you're in here right (laughs) so that's that was kind of messed up like when i realized that was going on like they're all locked up with keys um i don't know something about that seems real deranged um ganondorf's got some some screws loose man he's uh... (laughs) a well we all know that Secretly, he just wanted to make sure that Link saved all the Gorons before he beat the temple because he'd need all the keys. Because Gor- he's actually a good guy, that Ganondorf. Oh, you know? yeah? Deep down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you he know? He just wants to help Link. You know? <laughs> he's just trying to help Link get stronger, right, Anthony? He's preparing the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he saw he He's saw training Link. him. Yeah, he saw Link. He's, he's giving him some training, some proper training. That's why he's so impressed every time Link does something. He's Link's life coach. You know, yeah, personal a, trainer. You know, yeah, he's his PT. This was the friendship that Sheik was talking about, making sure he eats enough cuckoos and gets all the protein and stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're, this whole game is really just in an ideology of Link and Ganondorf becoming friends with each other. Right, they're just striving to have the perfect tennis match, and then and then their friendship eventually comes to the brutal end. But we're not going to get there yet. So I guess the next enemy to talk about is probably the mini boss, the dancing guy that we mentioned that Agoron talked about. Yeah, we've covered all of the new enemies that this dungeon has, and that leads us to what Cameron mentioned: the flare dancer is the mini boss. 
This is one of my favorite. You got to fight him twice. When I was a kid. Really? Um, I'm a little bit less impressed with it now, but it is still fun, I think. It's easy. Um, just because of the, the nature of it. I mean, it is easy, but it's also a very dynamic fight if you don't, if you're not quick <laughs> with it. Um, cause that guy will like skate around in big circles and he's all like dressed up in fire and it's just, it's really cool. I don't know. I think visually, like I was very, um, like impressed by it's a it cool, as a kid. It's a cool visual. Yeah. He definitely looks cool. Uh, he's, I, I feel like he's one of the easiest mini bosses. Personally. Yeah, I actually didn't even get to see one of his attacks uh, because <laughs> I never let him attack a single time in either of the fights. So I was like, "Oh, he does run around there, moving the room, doesn't he?" All right. So what did what did you? Because I mean, Dan? honestly, all I did he, was he like he dances him. a little on the top. Yeah, he dances a little on the top. He jumps down. You look at where he jumps. You run over to him. You hook shot him. You grab his little black nugget out of the middle of that <laughs> fire. The little piece of cute coal that's dancing around in there. You yank him on out, and then you start hitting him. And every time you get in front of him he's like ah and he jumps and he turns around so you can kind of like get in front of him smack him he goes ah and he turns around and then you just like smack him get in front of him again and you just keep him running around and yeah he goes through like three phases and then it's over it's maybe like a 50 second fight maybe like a minute fight but what is cool is he does change colors every time you you grab the coal out yeah so he goes you can tell where his health's at by the color of the red to blue to green green's like he's almost out you almost put him out not that you have to change your um your strategy at all though you would think no, like no. the colors might mean something but they they don't he yeah. might move a little faster when he's at lower health so blue and green but other than that nothing different yeah it's also interesting to use the red blue and green because it's also you know pro- I, I don't want to say it's it's direct symbolism but you know, back to the power, the wisdom, and the courage, the red, blue, green, you know? Oh, no, he's in wisdom form. Look out. Yeah, like, it's, it, I don't know what this, what they made that distinction of changing colors. I mean, it's cool, but why? Yeah, I don't know. And, unless we want to attach that to it. <laughs> they probably just want to keep throwing that color scheme in there, so you're like, hey, those colors, there they are again, yeah. red. Yeah, So, do you guys want to talk about... The how did you guys like the actual uh look of the temple at all? Um, I mean, like, it's fiery, it's red, everything's like glowing. It's anything I mean, it's, stand it's out dope, to you? I guess. What anything stand out to you, really, from the look of the temple? Yeah, um, I no, I didn't, haven't looked at the map. Hold on, this is is there a shape to it? You see, this dungeon to me is always like everything before the big boulder room and then everything that's after the big boulder room. <laughs> that's Makes literally sense. how I've always thought of this temple. Makes I get sense. to the big boulder room. I'm like, Oh, I'm about halfway, maybe a little less through this dungeon. I leave the boulder room onto like the last hub area. And I feel like, oh, I'm almost done with this, du- this dungeon now. Makes sense. Makes sense. I can't find my reference I wanna do, material to even talk about what this dungeon uh, looks like. So I want to bring a little thing into this. Um, that Nintendo actually cut out of the game that I think would have been cool, but I get why they cut it out. So this temple originally during production had a lot of Islamic roots in it, and they had a lot of religious Islamic iconography. Oh my goodness. I- iconography. Icon- <laughs> Thank you. Iconography. And a lot of Islamic chanting in the background music, as opposed to what we have now. Um, this was in the base game files of the N64, so people had data mined that uh, original cartridges that were sent out, and they eventually cut them from production. Um, it's probably really rare at this point to actually have an N64 file that has that stuff in it, but they are floating around the internet if you could find them but yeah they used to have a lot of islamic background in this temple yeah the the story i had heard was that it was like they they took a bunch of like sound clips that were basically like public domain to make the, the music for this um mm-hmm. including the chanting um so it was like a an open source like you know any creative commons whatever you want to call it but they um they grabbed it, and then it it wasn't until after it was, like, already put in that they realized, oh, wait, like, this is kind of a religious thing. Like, this is, like, a prayer chant of some kind. Mm-hmm. Um, 
then they decided to remove it after that. Um, so I don't know what the chant was actually about, you know, like, I don't know what it said. I don't know anything like that. I just know that I, like, I've heard the same, the same kind of bit of trivia. Um, but I didn't see any like symbolism in the temple either. Like, was there more references than just that? Or was that? Well, if you look at the, at the platforms, uh, towards the beginning, like the big room where the fire keys are and the red bubbles. Uh, it, I, I couldn't find any that was still in the game, but there are a few, like, yeah, sort of like how when, you know, you said the forest temple last time was supposed to be a a completely different temple, but they still kept some of the same things. I sort of felt that after I read that. Yeah. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if or how or when we were going to kind of talk about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Gerudo in general have, have caught a lot of controversy, um, for similar yeah. th- things like there, there used to be a star and moon pattern on the blocks and stuff like that. And, um, and that's the thing is like all the blocks were a reference to the Gerudo tribe because that was the Gerudo symbol. Um, and they replaced it with, uh, almost like this, this face. I think it's supposed to be like a Kotake or Kuume face or something like that. Um, who are characters that we haven't met yet, but, um, they replaced the symbol. They, they made a new Gerudo symbol. Um, to kind of to kind of get rid of that. I mean, unfortunately, like I know that just learning f- like back in high school, right? Like a lot of times when you're trying to tell a story, one of the fastest ways to develop a character for your audience is to use stereotypes. Um, so, um, I remember there was like an example of of like uh, I don't know, like I, I remember learning that when we were covering like of mice and men. But for this, I mean, they, I mean, they tried to build a, a fantasy desert people. Um, so to do that, I, th- I believe they took a bunch of different influences from other desert peoples of actual like the real world earth. Yeah. Which included Islamic like influence. Um, you know, like it wasn't just Islam, like they mixed together um, a, 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 a good set of um, different cultures to try to build this this one and um some of the things got kind of picked out as like okay well, this is kind of crossing a line like this this might be seen as um insensitive so yeah. they had to remove a lot of that from the game um which i understand like from from a perspective of especially like them being a business like you can't just <laughs> you know you can't just make your art and just always have that be what it is like you, you really need to be sensitive you need to think through like what message you're sending um, but I know that that, I don't, I don't believe that was Nintendo's intention. I don't think that they were trying to like pick on anybody, but yeah. No, I wouldn't think so. I don't know. For me, aside from the Gerudo people, aside from the, the Gerudo desert area, I honestly feel like the fire temple and the forest temple give me more like Aztec Incan vibes over anything. If you look at like ancient temples and art that used to be um mayan used to be incan it sort of resembles that a lot like just the just the way that the design is for the temple it's got like the indiana jonesy feel right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's at least how i feel about them i can see that i think the especially the the big room in the forest temple where the elevator originally goes down and the platforms and doorways going off in the different direction gives me a vibe like that as well as the initial room of the fire temple where there's like the dragon statue on the left and the staircase going up the middle splitting yeah. uh, left and right yeah kind of gives me that vibe of like one of those big temples that they would build or something like that some of their grandiose artwork yeah architecture yeah, I was definitely getting those vibes from this temple. Yeah. All right. So you wanna you wanna cut back to Flare Dancer because we get a certain special weapon after this fight. Man, before we go on, I just I imagine that Goron just like on the like that was like use the special crop against the dancing enemy like. Just like on the sidelines, like use the special crop, use the special crop. <laughs> He's cheering you on. <laughs> special crop. Make make him go boom. It ain't gonna work, Larry. They're like following you through the dungeon. 
Okay, you, you didn't use it. It was perfect. Shut up. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So yeah, we get the uh we get the legendary hammer. Um the megaton hammer. I just call it thong. I believe a megaton is like the unit of like what unit of power, unit of energy that you, you measure like nuclear explosions in, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Ex- extremely large blast. Yeah. Um, which is cool because I mean you do kind of you know, just you hit the ground with it and it makes a big shake that kind of like you know, it can it can flip lava slugs, I know that. <laughs> so it's you know Oh yeah, it can hit rusty switches really well too. It, it, can, it can knock the rust right off an old switch. That's right. I don't know how really scientifically accurate they were going with the megaton hammer, but megaton is essentially one million tons. So if the hammer really weighs one million tons or can output one million joules or, you know, the equivalent of that blink, you work out. So, <laughs> so um, fun, fun fact, aside from like shaking the earth and having, uh, you know, special effects on certain enemies um, and switches, I guess, um, the megaton hammer actually does the same amount of damage as the master sword. Um, so, so the master sword also so the ma- <laughs> no it's got magical powers yeah, no it's evil spain man yeah because <laughs> it hurts a lot <laughs> apparently <It's> just, <laughs> and we fighting against evil it's oh, crazy man. yeah so um yeah this is the uh this is the legendary hammer that the uh that the the hero i guess that predated link uh, in the history of the Gorons used to defeat Volvagia the first time. Um, and as people say, it's apparently the only way to defeat Volvagia. And our sworn brother Darunia had went into the room. So, you know, that tells us is we have to get in there to help Darunia with this hammer. Because he didn't have it, obviously. Right. It's, it's funny, because I think once you get the hammer, like... One of the first things you do is go out and you smash this like block with a face on it, and it becomes a new platform in that room where we first saw Darunia. Mm-hmm. Um, but Link falls with the platform a good few stories and doesn't take any fall damage from it. Um, so it's almost like I don't know. It's there's a few places. There's actually another place in the dungeon too where there's like a really narrow bridge. And if you fall off of it, you fall all the way back down to like the first like lava covered room that has all the different little platforms around. Um, And if you fall down that, you maybe lose like half a heart, even though in any other location in the game, you would lose several hearts for that move. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Well, we all know Link can take his fall damage. Right. He doesn't really care. Like in this temple, he doesn't care about fall damage. He's like this. This temple, they just give him a pass for some reason. Maybe it's because the um, I don't know. The, maybe the air rising is like making him fall slower or something. I don't, it doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me, but you know. Oh, speaking of falling, do you guys know the ladder trick that you can drop and still catch the ladder? Yeah, it's fun. Oh yeah. man, I feel I feel so behind because I just realized that in this dungeon with the the first. Uh, the first ladder you get to, mm-hmm. I just realized, I, I tried it, I, j- I dropped down and then I caught myself and dropped down again and caught myself and I was like, oh, never knew it. Never <laughs> knew it existed. I don't know if yeah. you guys knew it, I just wanted to bring it up. No, yeah, I, I always try to, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a pretty long ladder, I always try to do that, I try to catch myself before I hit the bottom and then once it's a safe fall, go for it, you know? Um, sometimes it doesn't work the way you want it to and you just make a bigger fall than you hoped for and you lose hearts but you know it's all good yeah you don't need them hearts I usually just let them plummet to losing (laughs) hearts anyways (laughs) yeah I usually have some fairies anyways Um, so yeah so we knock down this big platform don't take any fall damage and I think we just gotta make like a quick loop get the boss key and then we're back in the room to, to go help Darunia yes Hello, Ryan Fonzi here, co-host and editor of this week's episode of A for No, B for Yes. Um, 
just wanted to pop in and say thank you all for listening. Um, we hope that you're enjoying the show. Um, I know that this week we did end up covering a little bit of the included Islamic references that were removed during the initial release of the game um, for Nintendo didn't want to offend anybody. And likewise, we don't want to offend anybody here at the podcast. Um, just to be clear, I know that um, in our talk, we did mention how um, a lot of times stereotypes can be used to develop a character or to try to um, build the story. Um, and while this is true, um, there's a lot of ways in which stereotypes obviously have been used um, for discriminatory purposes, have been used in in um, negative ways that we, we here don't um, wish to propagate whatsoever. A stereotype is a widely held belief um, that is almost always an oversimplified version of things um, to the point where it doesn't meet the person-to-person -person descriptions um, and, and a lot of times is, is, um, can be false overall. And so like when you're trying to describe something and you use a culture or a people or even a faith um, to try to describe it, um, a lot of times you can leave out a lot of detail and a lot of respect depending on where this is pointed. Um, so in this case, um, I know that the, the Gerudo people, part of the problem is that they're uh, widely seen as, as like the bad guys of the game or um, the Gorons, I suppose, um, would be seen as kind of not the deepest thinkers, right? So, so kind of adding any group um, into their, into their influence could be demeaning in a way. Um, and again, like we don't really want to continue that thought process. Um, in the same, in the same way, I know that we did mention how we feel like Nintendo was trying to build a fantasy desert people um, and that, Islamic influence would have been included in that. Um, and just to clarify, um, the Islamic faith is is not confined to a, a desert people of any kind. It's it's actually a, a global faith, the second largest, in fact. Um, and while it may have origins in in a, a geographical location, uh, you know, characterized by a desert landscape, um, it really like the two aren't mutually exclusive in any way um so even even that alone is a, is a little bit problematic and while we don't know everything there is about the islamic faith um you know it it is worth mentioning that we wish to be respectful of it um and i guess it, it kind of is worth mentioning that although you know we didn't make this game um you know it's it's not our ip it's nintendo's um you know, we still, um, as fans, as players, like, you know, feel the need to to not turn a blind eye to to some of these details. Um, it's important to know what it is you're a fan of, and um, to be able to to understand, um, even when there's uh, mistakes or questionable content. Um, in this case, um, I think that the company who made the game um, tried to also make some respectful choices. Um, unfortunately, I know that in a few episodes from now, um, we're going to be talking about the Gerudo people and some of and some more of the influences that went into creating them. Um, and so we're not quite out of the dark yet. Um, there's still more to be said, um, both for the group in the game and the real world groups that were used to inspire them. Um, and so there's still kind of a task to handle down the line. Um, so again, like we wish to, to take it on as respectfully as possible. Um, our intention with this podcast was never to um, give our opinions on people of the real world or what they believe, where they're from, how they live their lives. Um, our goal was to examine this story and try to find um, deeper meanings and things, lessons learned, um, just be able to gain some new perspective on, on what is, you know, one of the most widely known games ever made. Um, to that effect, taking a look at the making of, I guess, in this case, the, the lessons learned, the takeaway is to, is to be careful of, of stereotypes and to be respectful of, um, of your, your influence. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, like if if we've offended anybody, um, we're we're very sorry. Like that that really isn't our intention. We're 
we're hoping to provide a service to to other fans of this game um and we hope that um we can we can do justice to that goal and to that to that um to that end so again thank you all for listening and i hope you enjoy the rest of this show um if if you feel like you want to reach out to us about this topic um definitely do so um this is something that again like we we feel like we we very much want to be respectful of and if there's anything that we do that is um hurtful uh we want to be able to to make amends um so um again like we hope you enjoy the show and uh, we'll jump right back into it thanks um we enter the boss room and we are uh you can kind of see it from a distance because he doesn't start immediately um like the doorway i think there's like one more little platform and then the boss platform which looks like a like six dots right is it six or is it more than that nine right it's a three by three yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, it's like nine <laughs> holes with what looks like lava right inside them. Yeah, like six. No, sorry, I keep saying six, but what I mean is nine. Um, <laughs> nine like hot patches, like little pools of lava. Um, and you can make your way over there. Um, and Volvagia will emerge from one of these holes. Um, I don't remember the full name. He is the subterranean lava dragon, Volvagia. He is a large red <clears throat> bellied dragon with flame coming out of his head. He kind of looks like he has a mask on. He has arms and what looks like opposable fingers to me, which is really weird. And he basically resembles a Chinese dragon. His like. lava hair is so majestic. By the way, I had to mention. <laughs> yeah, whenever, whenever he comes out of a hole, he does like a little L'Oreal commercial thing, where he whips it in a big yeah, circle, it's and then it like slows. I down. love it. Um, I don't. Can you get I hit by that hair? Garnier. Is that an attack? You can. And okay. I actually beat him that way um, as fast as I could. The second I saw his little lava spurts come up, I would just run over, get hit by that Megaton hammer his face in, and then just go to town on his face but right. like it does if, you, if you. you're too slow on getting to him like so you don't want to be too quick because then you get hit by the hair and if you're too slow he'll breathe fire that does like three hearts worth of damage so you got to time it where you're going the at hair him, only does one but you so go between you the hair and that. the fire yeah the hair is safer so if you go early that's better <laughs> <laughs> early bird gets the worm volvagia made me lose a fairy oh really <laughs> Made me lose a fairy too, on that three heart run, man. He took one right out of me. He just he just breathed fire on me, and Link was down. I was like, oh man, <laughs> Link I, was gone. Yeah. Full I got hit by the fire once and lost three hearts. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Fonz was right. It's too much. <laughs> I got hit by a rock for like two or two and a half. Oh yeah, those rocks were painful. Oh man, you guys know the trick with the rocks, though, right? What's that? They only fall from like where it's going, so it follows the like a pattern of how it would move. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can watch the dragon. You can watch the shadows on the ground, which isn't like great because the shadows are pretty subtle. Um, but what you can also do is you can hang on the edge of the arena, and none of the rocks will hit you. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. So I that's like out there. just in in some of the streamer circles that I've been kind of like frequenting um that's that's like a trick that everyone likes to shout into the chat into the chat <laughs> it's like hang off the edge hang off the edge i'm like i know <laughs> <laughs> i've seen, I've seen you guys it. comment this 800 times <laughs> i will hang off the edge <laughs> ah but, okay that's a good tactic yeah there's no there's no attacks out there so once the he he's, he'll just float around the rocks will fall eventually he goes back into the ground rocks still fall for a few seconds and then you can just get back up and continue the fight like nothing happened Ah, okay. I was going to say, honestly, this fight is basically like advanced whack-a-mole. So if you guys are good at whack-a-mole, you'll be really great at this boss fight. Mm -hmm. Whack-a-vole. Sure, yeah, whack. Whack-a-vole. Vagia. Title. There you go. There, there it is. There's that. That's the game. 
Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's basically that. I mean, you, you just smack them as, as fast as you can. And honestly, if you can dodge... I've never even seen the fire. But if you can dodge the falling rocks, you, you're golden. You will claim the trophy. You will beat Volvagia. Right. Yeah, so you can usually... Um... When it's coming in and out of the hole, you can usually land a bomb if you're good about it. And while it's flying, you can hit it with arrows. And then you can hit it with the hammer. I obviously get time to attack it when it, like, falls and it, like, kind of half comes up out and does its L'Oreal commercial hair flip. (laughs) Uh, Those are the main ways I've found how to damage it or when it is capable of being damaged. Nice. Nice. No. Ended up using up my resources pretty well. Like, I hit it with arrows where I could and with bombs where I could and... The hammer and sword. Oh, or yeah. Else. When it's flying in the air, if you time it right, you can hit him with arrows in the air. Yeah, if you're like walking, you get in front of him and walk the way that he's flying, your arrows will hit him and mm-hmm. actually register. Yeah, it's a nice, yeah, nice, nice extra I, damage I, tactic. I did do that as well, yeah. Yeah. The, um, so that's my advice to dealing damage to this boss. Gotcha. There's a, a speedrunner tactic where technically there's actually two Volvagias during the entire fight. There's the one that's flying through the air and there's the one that's underground. And the one that's flying through the air, or no, the one that's underground has a hitbox that's actually on one of those nine holes. And you can just keep throwing bombs onto that hole and hearing the damage sound effect because it's hitbox. Even though its actual character model isn't there, its hitbox can take damage by that hole. Oh, I just wow. don't know which hole it is. So you can speed up the fight a lot by just getting constant bomb damage. It's probably the one he comes out of in the beginning, but maybe not. It might be. There was a guy who used the camera to look under the map during the boss fight. I think he was, he was doing some mods. And when he's in the hole, like when he's not flying around, when, when Volvag is actually in the hole, he looks like a coiled up ball, almost like a coiled up snake. And then as he comes out, the ball stays coiled hmm. and he'll come out and slowly come out of the ground. And then you'll slow. It's almost like spig- like you're taking like a piece of spaghetti out of the bowl. You'll just slowly see it uncoil, but it's always in a ball when he's in under one of the holes. And I thought it was really weird. Hmm. doesn't really add any, I guess, lore to the fight, but yeah. <laughs> just, it's just like a mess of spaghetti. And then he comes out and it's slowly he's like, no, I saw I saw somebody like clip under like I watched a video where somebody like because I because I, I had the question I'm like what happens if you use an ice arrow against him right um, and there was somebody who did a video where they like clipped underneath the arena and you just shoot oh. him over and over again and he doesn't ever move it doesn't even start the fight I was like what, what? <laughs> so like he was able to kind of do some some math and figure out how much health Volvagia has and like how much different arrows do when you're fighting him. Um, and kind of what the win conditions are. Because I think there's a... You have to defeat him with, like, a slashing item, I think, for the most part. Like, you can't you can't shoot him to kill him. Um, which is... I think unless a spe- very specific condition is met. Like, I think he has to be at a certain health in order for you to shoot him to kill him. Like, it's... There's, there's some crazy rules that were kind of figured out. But, huh. yeah. They broke the game a little bit to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a weird shot to me. What what you're describing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they did something where they bombed themselves and fell through the ground. Yeah, that's that's a weird shot. You bomb yourself in a weird in like certain positions, and it kind of glitches your guy for when you pull out either the hook shot or arrows, so that you're in a wall or under the ground or in the ceiling. And until you go out of that, you're still there. So you can hook shot to something through a wall because you're technically inside the wall. That's what I see a lot of the weird shots used for. Mm. Okay. I guess this guy used it to beat Volvagio with ice arrows. Yeah, pretty much. Nice. Um, so so yeah, I mean I think as long as we're we're good on crazy Volvagia glitches that we found online. <laughs> Volvagia is dead. We Defeated. Yeah, this is our this is our second adult boss that we have uh, quelled, right? So we go ahead and uh, make our way through that blue portal, uh, where we end up back in the chamber of sages, and we're faced with Darunia once again. Um, yeah, this time, um, you know, he he thanks you. Um, he says uh, he thanks you on behalf of the entire Goron race. Um, he says he turned you turned out to be a real man, just as I thought you would. Um, and he says, by the way, um, 
I, the wild Darunia, t- turned out to be uh, the great sage of fire. Um, you know, he says, isn't this funny? Um, this must be what they call destiny. Um, you know, nothing has made me happier than helping you seal the evil here. Um, and then he says, hey, brother, take this. This is a medallion. Um, has the power of fire and my friendship. You know, so this is your second friendship medallion. And he says, you're now real true brothers. Yeah, just don't forget, now you and I are true brothers. Two brothers. So, yeah, the, the name of the show is just <laughs> True Brothers. It's just two brothers. Um, just sworn, sworn br- true brothers. No, I think, because, um, you know, when Saria, like, when her thing fades out to white is when it said, um, you know, you and Saria will always be friends. And then I think when this one, when it fades out to white, it says, don't forget, now you and I are true brothers. Um. Which is actually kind of more directly from Darunia, whereas the other one seemed more like a narration. Um, but either way, I think that the distinction that they're, they're making here now is like, okay, there, there's got to be a difference, right, between sworn brothers and true brothers. Um, like, I think sworn brothers, like, kind of signifies an agreement of sorts. Like, hey, like, we've we've agreed that we are now, like, that, like, we basically, like, decided together that we are brothers like this is how we're gonna kind of continue on with our lives like this is how we're gonna do stuff like it's kind of it's kind of cool that when link comes back after seven years darunia just picks up the friendship like nothing even happened like he's just like yo right right where we left off guess what ganador's back i need your help i'm going it's go time can you go to (laughs) you know like he's like took you a long time to get that blue potion from the shop bro like like dang man yeah, but no, like he puts a lot of trust in Link right off the bat. He's like, listen, like it's not this isn't a, a Goron problem that you have to like prove yourself again to to help out with. He sees you in and he's just immediately like, Oh yeah, sworn brother, come on, come on and help. Right? Yeah, he already knows you're capable. Right. And like, you know, he's he's clearly like trust you. hasn't lost the friendship. I mean, he probably doesn't even know if you were gone or not. Like he I don't with the way the Gorons live in the mountain, like you know, they you remember like where did, where's Link? He probably just went home or something. You know, like they probably didn't even question it. Um, yeah, I feel like Link has this air about him that he just shows up and then stuff gets better and then he just kind of pieces. <laughs> yeah. So so I feel like as soon as Darunia just saw Link in the Fire Temple, he's like, oh, thank goodness he's back. All right, this will be all over soon. Hey, I'm gonna go distract this guy. You do everything else. All right. <laughs> right. Like you remember last time? Same stuff. Let's just do that. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so, so he immediately just puts his trust in you guys go, you do think like you basically, so, so Link goes out and like now individually saves each of these Gorons, like basically treats the Gorons as if they were his own brothers and sisters, right? Or I guess just brothers and brothers, because again, no female Gorons. Um, but you know, he, he comes back and it's like, you know, he was totally on this mission with Darunia. And now that like they've had this whole second experience of actually working together on a dungeon, um, like you've kind of like, you know, this is your friendship that has grown stronger with time. Like this is, you know, like it's developed into this righteous power where like you guys are kind of helping each other out um, just completely selflessly. Right. Like it's this righteous path of, of, I guess, altruistic, like, you know, you basically have decided, like, I am going to take responsibility for these Gorons as if they are my own family. Um, and I think that's kind of what made that distinction of, like, okay, like, now you're true brothers. I mean, not that you didn't do that before, but, you know, Link was kind of on a mission to get a stone back then. <laughs> like, like he proved himself, but, like, he didn't build any relationships along the way. Like, he, he kind of just, <laughs> like, quietly came in, was like, all right, y'all need food. All right, let's eat. He goes and <laughs> blows up a Dodongo and comes back, you know, like he yeah. didn't individually save anybody who could have just, you know, had a meal of a different rock. So I think that there's a, there are some like differences in how much, um, I don't know, like how much the relationship has grown. Um, so that's, that's kind of that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think one other thing that I wanted to kind of talk about is this, um, the difference between the items, right? Because when you start out and you're a kid, the first time you come here, um, you get bombs. 
like you get the ability to use bombs like basically from, from pulling them off the ground and you also get the ability to kind of pull them out of your pocket and chuck them at things um but bombs again like we we mentioned it before they're very uncontrolled like you just throw them somewhere and they send forces out in every which direction and that's that's kind of how a bomb works it's just so much power in one area that it just you know releases every which way like there's no control there's no focus um but the megaton hammer is um is even like arguably as much if not more power um being that it's called the megaton hammer like that's i mean that's indicative of a bigger bomb <laughs> you know mm-hmm. um but it's also focused. Like you actually find things to specifically hit with it um, to the point where Link can stand inches away from the thing he's hitting and not get affected, you know? Um, So there's more of a control there. There's more, it's like a more mature power, you know? Kind of in the same way that like... Because Link has truly mastered his power, basically. Yeah, like kind of in the same way like him overcoming like new fears that were more mature like now he's discovering more power that is also more mature <laughs> i guess so i don't know it's 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 really cool how they kind of built that difference into the game another thing i just thought of that's kind of interesting is that out of the three original child dungeons uh the bomb coming from Dodongo's cavern is the only one that's actually usable as an adult because the slingshot and boomerang are inaccessible Oh yeah, that's true. Hmm. You can't use them. Man, nah. never thought about that. So it's like maybe the courage and the wisdom that he had when he was a child kind of had to change in enough of a way that he couldn't really access what it used to be. But the power has evolved, but it's still, you know, kind of the same. Still has access to to it all the same. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a that's actually a good topic cuz like if you take the example of the hammer that is used in the fire temple versus the bombs to show his growth in power, um, you can almost you can almost say that the growth in courage, you know, we get the slingshot, and once you go to the forest temple, we get the bow, and I don't know how you could really wrap courage into that, but it takes a lot of skill. And a lot of bravery to wield a bow and arrow around to try to kill things. Uh, aside from like, you know, using a sword, which is tried and true, you could miss with a bow. So you have to know, you have to have the courage to be able to, I guess, use that against enemies and believe that you can do it. Yeah, and both of those weapons come from the green theme dungeons of the child and adult. So it's like a direct upgrade of his courage, you know, as he needed to seven years down the line when uh, stuff has hit the fan. Yeah, and then if we're going to go back to how you mentioned it was just the bombs, uh, I feel like, you know, power doesn't need an upgrade. Power is just power. Courage, you can, gr- you can have more courage as you grow up, and you can obviously have more power. But if you want to take it into a thing of, like, movies and stuff, like, when people gain more power, they don't lose the power that they already had. Obviously, unless like you have to trade power for power, but for here, it's like you always get more power. So why would he lose any of his powers? I don't know. It was an interesting yeah. you brought up. I like that. It would. It's still like he could access his his power in the explosive, uncontrolled way, but he's just learned to control it and fine tune it if need be. With a yeah. whole. Whereas megaton. courage, courage and wisdom, you'd really never need to go backwards. There might still be a time and place for e- explosive power that's not as as controlled to like let it go wild kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. You never need to go backwards. That was a good line. Yeah. All right. So unless we want to cover what else you can do on this mountain, I think that pretty much wraps up um, the fire temple. I will say there is. There is a great fairy fountain right to the right of Yeah, right right out right outside the temple, but you can't get it into it until you have the hammer. Yeah, upgrade your magic meter. Get some more spins. Double the magic. Get get double the power. Cause you got the first magic meter here too. Double the spins. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean that I mean it, it does kind of just play right along with that though, because I mean that's you know, magic power the first time you're you're here and now double magic power the next time you're here. I mean it's Plays right into the same thing, you know? Yep. So it's cool like that. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else we wanted to cover um, before we kind of sign off? This is probably the shortest episode we've ever recorded. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really think there's anything else that I've found on the mountain. I know that the area that used to have, like rumble and the rocks would fall and the ground would turn red when you're a kid no longer does that when you're an adult. Um, hmm. no, it, it, it will, it, um, it just, the rocks fall a different way. So when you're a kid, um, when the rocks come to fall, you kind of have to go underneath your Hylian shield if you want to be safe, because they will, they will lock on to Link. Like no matter how you move, the shadow will be right above you. You kind of have to turtle up to be safe. Yeah. Um, and when you're an adult, the shadows will actually like try to lead you a little bit. Like they'll be, they'll, they'll pick a spot, like kind of where you're headed. Um, and they won't move once once they're established. So you can actually avoid them by just running in zigzags and stuff like that. Oh, well, maybe they just don't fall at all times because I ran down that path and was thinking, it's weird. There's no rocks falling. And they didn't do it at all the whole time I ran down it right after beating the, the fire temple. So maybe after beating the fire temple, it doesn't happen? Yeah, maybe. I don't know, or I just hit, had hit it at a weird time where it just didn't do yeah, it, it, or it might just be some, something yeah, happened. Some kind of conditions you have to meet for that to not happen. But I just know that getting back up there and and stuff like that, like especially with what we're going to talk about next episode, um, it's one of the it's one of the um, more obnoxious obstacles. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So this was our our fire temple episode. Um, I guess just as a reveal. Um, next episode, we are not going directly to the water temple. We are actually going to, we're going to do the ice cavern. Um, but then instead of doing the water temple attached to that, we are going to instead, um, go after, uh, Epona and the big Goron sword, which are, are two quests that are technically optional. Um, I mean, one is very optional, not, very not everybody even ever goes for the big Goron sword, but it is a, it is a very cool item to have. Um, it can be very useful. It makes a lot of battles it's a lot shorter if you use power. it right. Right. But, um, but yeah, uh, at, wait, is Epona actually, um, that you don't have to get Epona? I thought Epona was a hundred percent necessary. No, you never need to get Epona. You can leave her in that stable. You there's no, there's no place in the game. You never need to jump over the bridge. Can you get across that bridge some other way? Uh, with the long shot, I think. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So you'd already have beaten the. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, really, I thought I definitely would have thought Epona would be a, a need, but interesting. But who doesn't want to get that cute face out of that terrible right. man stable? Right. Right. Hey, come on. You know, we're gonna talk about Ingo. I got I got some stuff. She to deserves talk about. better, man. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, definitely give us your feedback, everyone. We would love to hear if you have any corrections for us or anything that you would like to touch upon. We would appreciate anyone's feedback and we wanna thank everyone for listening to this episode. Uh Ryan, you wanna tell them where we can find or they can find us? Um, yeah, so our, our number one spot is our, our, I guess, our Facebook page at uh, A for No, B for Yes. Um, but we also have our email at A for No, B for Yes at gmail.com. Um, the spelling is, you know, numbers for the fours. Um, but uh, we'll put a link in the description or, you know, put a uh, a URL or an email address there for you to, to just copy and paste <laughs> um, if it doesn't work as a link. Um, so, yeah. Um, go ahead and, and take a look at that. Send us, send us your thoughts. Um, let us know if we got something egregiously wrong. <laughs> uh, let us know if we got something only a little bit wrong and you just want to talk to us about it or, you know, send us your fan theories. Like we, we are all about it. Um, we want to hear Love from it. you. Um, it doesn't even have to be necessarily about the episode we're covering. We'll figure out a way to work it in if, if, uh, if that's something that you're cool with. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out. Hit us up. Thanks for listening, everyone. Did you get all that? <laughs>